It was as they were making their preparations to leave for Virginia that Brewster re-antagonized James by starting to print Puritan materials to sell in England. He sold Brown's old books as well as Cartwright's, which were the biggest sellers. Another was a book by someone who had written deeply personal criticisms of the king. Their English contacts continued to support them, though they were reprimanded, but Brewster had to lay low at the crucial moment that the venture was coming together. His books, paper, and printing type were seized, and though he was the second in command to John Robinson, who wouldn't be sailing to America at this point, Brewster wasn't available to help plan the mission at its most crucial stages, and even when the ship did set sail, Brewster's name was left off the manifest. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvola, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. The Pilgrims had considered Guiana, Virginia, and New England as final settling points, noting that the fishing would be better in Cape Cod than anywhere in Virginia. They wanted to be far enough away from the main colony to set up a colony that adhered to their strict Calvinist beliefs and values, but one that was close enough that they could turn to Virginia for help when necessary. Furthermore, Sands had been encouraging them to go to Virginia, and the Plymouth Company had just gone out of business. They decided to settle at the very northern edge of the Virginia Company patent, near the Hudson River. The Virginia Company of London was struggling, and the Plymouth Company had just gone out of business. One of the ways that the Virginia Company had started to try to make money was authorizing particular plantations, which meant selling patents to individual groups of people who could then have who would then have a certain amount of time to finance, organize, and set up a colony before the patent expired. That essentially eliminated Virginia Company financial liability for a colony, and it ensured at least a small profit for the company. When the Plymouth Company was reorganized as the Council for New England in 1620, Gorges and his associates used this model of colonization exclusively. They'd suffered their own failures early on, and they'd watched the Virginia Company struggle to survive for almost two decades. This model of colonization would ensure the Council's ability to to remain financially solvent, and it also contributed to a fascinating difference between New England and Virginia, which would reverberate through the centuries. Virginia was colonized by and large by individuals. The Virginia Company had appealed to individuals to come to America and to start a life there. New England came to be colonized by groups of people. The particular plantation required a group of people to come together, apply for a patent, raise the funds themselves, and go out as a unit, at least to start with. So while the Chesapeake was built on this individual model held together by kin relations of landed classes, New England was built on the township model by people who had, by and large, been townspeople in England. For the Pilgrims, though, this model meant that they needed to find financiers, also known as adventurers. They had a connection named Edward Pickering, related to Brown himself, who was a separatist who supported them strongly enough to leave them money in his will, and who knew a man named Thomas Weston, who was an investor looking for new sources of revenue. In a way, it was a relationship that could be mutually beneficial. They needed money, and he led a company of 70 investors. Both were interested in America, and neither had any other viable option. On the other hand, it was a relationship in which neither side really brought anything to the table in terms of the ability to make the voyage a success. 
the Pilgrims didn't have money or experience, and Weston was a 35-year-old gentleman who had no money and no income. He was the son of a Catholic family with a small amount of money and 16 children. His oldest brother would go on later to be knighted by Charles I, but Weston hadn't inherited anything. He had simply finished an ironworking apprenticeship and found himself with no income or money to start a business. He'd spent seven years trading the lowest end Welsh cotton, which he bought using IOUs, and he'd ultimately upgraded to selling unfinished wool products to the Dutch, again using IOUs. He didn't have the connections or the money to get involved with the monopolies trading high profit luxury imports. He just lived day to day doing whatever he could to survive. When this went wrong, a lawsuit put him in debt and he found himself with more and more tenuous financial footing. In the aftermath of Edwin Sand's famous speech and the subsequent dissolution of Parliament, James had attempted to raise royal revenue while stimulating the economy using something called the Cocaine Project, named for a man named William Cocaine. In this project, they'd start processing cloth in England and allow the people who had once funded the Dutch cloth trade to now fund the English processing industry. The Dutch, however, refused to buy the products of the Cocaine Project and Not only did that project collapse, the whole wool industry almost went with it. And the people who saved the wool industry demanded a monopoly on the trade, which forced men like Weston again out of business. Weston was one of the people who had been arrested in protest, but to no avail. There were some profitable things like fish and furs in North America and particularly New England. And so when the pilgrims came to Weston asking him to be an investor, he really had no other alternatives. Many of the members of Weston's group were Puritans who were not particularly sympathetic to Brownists. None of them had been Virginia Company shareholders either. And again, none of them had all that much money, although there were two who were on their way up in English society. Their names were Beauchamp and Shirley, and they were dedicated London Puritans. Beauchamp would go on to be a justice of the peace under Cromwell, and both were deeply connected to London Puritanism and the towns of the surrounding countryside. They were also connected to John Pocock, another deeply Puritan investor, and all three were members of the Honorable Artillery Company, which really was to Plymouth as the Cyrenicals had been to Virginia, a different organization that had a disproportionate number of investors were involved in. The Honorable Artillery Company would later form the core of tax opposition to King Charles and the core of the rebellion, which turned into the English Civil War. And that organization itself supplied multiple regicides. It was through their group that Miles Standish was recruited after acting as a Calvinist mercenary in the Netherlands. These people didn't particularly care about the fate of the pilgrims, though. In fact, pilgrims and Puritans didn't really like each other. The Puritans saw the Mayflower's voyage as an experiment. It was a gamble for profit, but also a way to start exploring colonization. However, in case the colony did take off, Pocock wanted to minimize Brownist influence in the colony and replace it with Puritan influence. For that, he sent Christopher Martin, who himself had a record of clashes with local church authorities, but who was a Puritan, not a separatist. Martin was made supply officer and governor, and his presence immediately shook the pilgrim community. Cushman went so far as to call him a monster, who insulteth our poor people with such scorn and contempt as if they were not good enough to wipe his shoes. If I speak to him, he flies in my face as mutinous, and saith that no complaints shall be heard or received but by himself. 
this small group of people, Pocock, Beauchamp, and Shirley, also started using their trading network to recruit other settlers, including Stephen Hopkins, who had spent two years in Jamestown before returning to London, getting married and having kids. By the end of their intervention, only 15 of 24 families were Leideners, comprising about half of the settlers. The Leideners found themselves at odds, even with the other Brownists of the company, like Hopkins. These hadn't been Smith's followers, they'd been Robinson's. And now they comprised barely half of the group heading to the New World, and found themselves surrounded by contemptuous strangers. The Pilgrims also rejected John Smith's offer for help. He had a strong personality, a worldly nature, and knew more than they did, so they knew that he would likely end up with more control over the colony than they wanted to give. And the problems of Weston's finances almost immediately became apparent. Although the Pilgrims didn't really know what was going on from his side of the story, so they started to think that he was cheating them. The first problem was that Weston was very slow in getting the Pilgrims a boat. So the Pilgrims actually bought their own boat in the Netherlands called the Speedwell. Unfortunately, due to either cheating or, as later records suggest, sabotage by the Dutch who wanted to colonize that part of North America, the ship was rendered useless when it was fitted with a mast big enough to put pressure on the seams of the ship and cause it to leak in high winds. The pilgrims never figured out how to fix it, and they ended up selling the ship at a loss, as well as being forced to leave a number of Leideners behind. The boat's new owners were quickly able to fix the problem, and it continued to sail flawlessly for years. Weston did finally get them the Mayflower, though, with John Clark as a pilot and a man named Christopher Jones as captain. Jones was from an East Anglican maritime town called Harwich, which was part of a network of Puritan sea towns across Europe, from La Rochelle to Gdansk and, of course, the Netherlands. In these towns, local sea captains tended to control the government and governed in a very Puritan way. And this is exactly what Jones did, becoming a Burgess in his mid-thirties, working his way up to bigger ships and more lucrative trades. His town's government hanged five women as witches, dragged harlots through the streets on a cart, and banned gambling. He himself was in the wine trade, specifically trading English wool for European wine and then selling the extremely popular and increasingly valuable drink back in England. His business was going great until the value of English wool started to decline. By 1619, he too was looking to America for financial solvency, specifically cod fishing, which, though not as extravagantly profitable as wine, yielded a respectable profit either through salted cod or train oil, which was used to make soap. By the time they were preparing to leave, even though most of them had sold everything, they were 350 pounds short of what they needed. This severely reduced the number of resources they had for their first winter in America. And since Weston didn't have any money either, he started insisting the colonists work seven days a week for the company, with even their houses treated as company assets for division after seven years. If he couldn't pay, the colony would collapse, and so Cushman readily agreed to the new terms. The rest of the pilgrims, including John Robinson, felt that the new terms were fitter for thieves and bond slaves than honest men, and it drove a wedge between Cushman and them, especially because they suspected that Weston was cheating them. Still, they had no choice but to accept Weston's terms, and in addition, they had to sell even more of their food, including more than two tons of butter, before they could afford to set sail. Adding in delays from the Speedwell ordeal, 
and the pilgrims had gone through about half of their food before they even left England. A few of the passengers decided to abandon the voyage at this point, even though that meant that they'd lose everything they'd invested so far, which for some meant everything that they'd owned. It was not a good idea to leave in the condition they left in, but they couldn't afford to leave later, so it was then or never, and the 50 remaining colonists decided to leave. Cushman stayed behind and tried to work with Weston to recruit new settlers to go to England. On September 6th, after 10 years of wandering and a year of planning and setbacks, the pilgrims were en route to New England. The normal hostility between mariners and settlers was exacerbated by the fact that the pilgrims' belongings and food took up space that the sailors usually used to store stuff that supplemented their own paltry wages, and the pilgrims showed the bitter side of separatism when they considered it God's will that the sailor who most viciously mocked them died. It was a rough voyage to a new place taken by people who didn't have experience and funded by people who didn't have money. They arrived in North America on November 11th, but not in Virginia. After some rough weather blew them off their intended path, they ended up 220 miles north of their intended destination. They were outside the Virginia Company's patent, so they had no legal regulations binding their colony from England. They couldn't be compelled to obey orders, and they were in a place that had been noted for its exceptional cod fishing and that they had considered as a destination. At this exact moment, amoebic dysentery, which was one of the most dangerous diseases associated with seafaring, started to appear on the ship, compelling them to stay in New England rather than sailing two to three days south. Now, part of me thinks that this is too perfect to be a coincidence. This is the perfect situation for a brownist, a place outside of existing legal boundaries where they could set up a Calvinist society with no top-down hierarchy. And it was one that just happened to be on the shores of the best cod fishing area of North America after saying that they intended to finance the mission by fishing. So it really worked perfectly for them. Furthermore, even though there were people of different backgrounds on the Mayflower, there were essentially no primary sources for this period apart from those written by Bradford and Winslow, two pilgrims. So it's hard to know exactly what happened and how they made the decisions they made. We only know how they justified those decisions in England. Regardless, a decade after the sea venture crashed in Bermuda, Stephen Hopkins found himself in a stunningly similar situation, and he behaved essentially the same, leading an attempt to get people to stay where they were rather than sail to Virginia. Some of the Leideners were reluctant to venture outside their patent, but Jones sided with Hopkins and they decided to set up their plantation in Cape Cod. They first landed on a Sunday and the next day began the New England tradition of a Monday wash day. And they also signed the Mayflower Compact. The compact is one of the most remembered documents in American history, though its actual importance is debated at this point. It was pretty radical for its time, though. It laid out the colony as a civil body politic and was signed by a majority of the male passengers. Its actual text was very short, but fits squarely within the Puritan framework In fact, it mimicked almost identically the type of society that Brown and his more respected associates like Morley and Mornay had advocated in the 1580s. Plymouth, like their ideal Christian assembly, would be guided by the people as a whole, run like an Athenian democracy, with even the preacher being subject to elections. At the same time, 
it would be run with a kind of uncompromising adherence to the law of Moses and the will of God found in Old Testament Israel. There would be complete democracy on one hand and complete regulation of behavior on the other. The key thing to understand about the Mayflower Compact is not its direct influence. It was used to help justify certain aspects of Plymouth government later on. But the important thing about the Mayflower Compact was the broader intellectual framework that it fit into. And that intellectual framework had a very profound impact on both English and American society in the future. It was an intellectual framework closely embraced by future New Englanders all the way through the Revolutionary War and into the foundation of America. And even earlier than that, it was an intellectual framework that would lead into the the English Civil War. This Puritan dichotomy of democracy and regulation of behavior We've seen it a little bit in Jamestown already, but it's something that becomes much, much more prominent over the course of time. But the Mayflower Compact was one of its earliest instances of practical application. And for that reason, it's an incredibly important document. Next In adherence to their new compact, they had to elect a leader. The Puritan investors in London would have liked to see Martin lead the colony, but he had made a point of being openly hostile to the Pilgrims. The colony was split almost 50-50 between the Pilgrims, who would vote as a block, and the rest of the colony, who ranged from London Brownists to mainstream Puritans to people who didn't even have religious beliefs or opinions. And... Martin simply couldn't win an election, but John Carver could. Carver, as opposed to Martin, had a relatively gentle manner and was well respected by most of the colonists. He himself was from East Anglia, though his wife was from Robinson's hometown of Sturton, and he had given more than just about anyone for the benefit of the colony. So, with their government and leadership organized, it was time to find a settlement location, and for this, Miles Standish led the way. Cape Cod was cold and snowy, but it was beautiful. There were massive trees with gaps big enough to ride a horse through. They saw whales and fish, geese and ducks, but perhaps most interestingly of all, the whole area seemed to be completely empty of native inhabitants. Some areas looked like they'd been recently inhabited, and others were just completely abandoned, with occasional unburied human bones littering the landscape. This was New England. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to first-hand accounts and things. See you next week.